the oldest book in the Bible. Um, that means that Job was actually written down before Genesis. Moses did not write Genesis. Genesis happened before Job, but Moses did not write the book of Genesis till he went up on the mountain. God gave him Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But as far as pinned down, 42 chapters in the book of Job, a picture of the last half of the great, of the tribulation, 42 months, and never one mention in 42 chapters of the law of God. And that and other reasons have caused a lot of Bible teachers to believe the book of Job was written actually before any other scripture. And I don't know about that, but it, it very well could be. And notice what Job said here in verse number 32. For he, talking about God, is not a man as I am, that I should answer him. And we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us. That's a good word there, betwixt. Old timers used to use that word betwixt. People make fun of, right? Betwixt me and you, you know. That's they know all that word. That's a Bible word. Good English word, right? Twixt. Betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him, let him take away his rod away from me and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. I want to preach to you this morning on the subject, Thank God for the daysman. Job said here, there's nobody in between me and God. He said, God is angry with me because of my sin. There's no daysman between me and God that we should come together in judgment. Now that word daysman is what I want to think about for a few minutes. And among the ancient people of the East, there was a fellow who they called a daysman. A daysman was an impartial umpire brought in to settle disputes among people. If somebody had an argument with somebody about a property line or a piece of land or a money disagreement about something, they, they, they brought in a daysman. Now what a daysman would do, he was like a judge. He would sit and hear one side, he would sit and hear the other side, and he'd put his hand on one man, put his hand on the other man, and he'd bring them together, and he'd say, we're going to settle this dispute. Job said, back in the Old Testament, he said, I'm far away from God. He said, my sins have separated me and God, There's and there's no daysman between me and God to settle this issue between me and Him. Now, though, as you know, as, as well as I know this more, what that typifies and speaks of, it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now our daysman that has come between us and God and spanned the mighty gulf between holy God and sinful man. Now, I want to preach to you about that this morning, and the way I want to do it is give you three days. The first day is Job's day. In Job's day, it was a, it was a tough time between God and man. All they knew about God is that God was a holy God that hated and judged and punished sin. That's what God did. And in Job's day, when a man said, uh, I've done wrong against God, he expected the wrath of God upon him. He said his rod is going to be on him. There's three things that characterize Job's day. Number one, he couldn't just come right out and walk right up to God and talk to Him. He was condemned by the law and separated by sin from God. He couldn't talk to God. He said, I can't talk to God. He said, something's come between me like, like a cloud blotting out the sun. That's sin. You know, that's what sin is this morning and does. It blocks out between us and God. Job said, I can't talk to Him. 
He said, I'd like to be able to. I'd like to just go get things straight between me and him. But he knows that God would not allow sin in his presence. And Job said, I cannot talk to him. The second thing, Job said, we can't come together in judgment. God will not tolerate it. My sins have separated me and God. In verse 32, Job said, I cannot come together with God at judgment. He said, there's something gone wrong. There's something that has happened. There's something that's gone wrong. You see, it wasn't always that way. Many, many years ago, when God made Adam, and He put Adam down that garden, had flowers and plants and trees and water squirting up, you know, it was absolutely perfect. Adam and Eve had what movie stars try to have today. When you see the rich and famous, and they show these big mansions, and they live in like in Beverly Hills or down in Long Beach, California, or somewhere, they always got plants and water squirting up, and they're walking through, you know, and have servants to wait on them, and everything's just so elegant and lovely. Well, Adam and Eve really had that. I mean, they had it, and to beat all of that, they had fellowship with their Creator. Nobody ever had it made like Adam and Eve did. And you know what happened? Uh, God put them down there in that garden. And the Lord put them down there in that garden. He said, uh, Adam, you can have anything you want except for that one tree. And he, Adam went to sleep one day and the Lord said, you need to take a nap. And Adam said, uh, uh, why? And the Lord said, because you need a help me. And you know, of course, he formed Eve from his side and he gave her to Adam. And of course, when he woke up, there she was, and, and they, they, they walked through the garden and had absolute perfect fellowship with God Almighty. Nobody has ever been satisfied like they were satisfied. Nobody in this, in, in old sinful world knows what Adam and Eve had. You can't imagine, you can't imagine every want being supplied, every need being taken care of, made in the image of God Himself. Himself. Can you imagine that? Adam and Eve just walked down the line. They could eat anything they want. They didn't have to worry about cholesterol. They didn't have to worry. Eve never had to worry about her uh, figure. She, I mean, how she shaped her. She didn't have to worry about getting fat. She didn't have to worry about. Uh, they didn't have to worry about cancer or diabetes. Or no disease. They didn't get old. They didn't have to worry about nothing. They absolutely had it made in perfect fellowship with God. And every day, the Lord would come down there. And He'd say, Adam, how's it going? Adam said, everything's wonderful. And they'd just walk and talk in the garden of God. I'm telling you, they had it made. They had it made until that day that sin came in. And as you know, when man, in the beginning, when man had fellowship with God, the devil broke it. It's like this, see? Here was Adam, here was God. And they was like this. And they had fellowship. And they had everything in common. And they just stayed like that all the time. But one day that horrible, dreaded time came when the devil appeared to Eve. And the devil said, Eve, why don't you take a bite of that fruit right there? And she said, oh no, God. God don't want us to take it lest we die. And the devil said it won't hurt you. You just go right ahead. Now up until this time Adam and Eve didn't know what it was like to sin. They didn't know what it was like to have fellowship with God broken. They didn't know what it was like to have God pull away from them. They didn't know what it was like to have God turn His back on them. They had always had fellowship with God. Don't know how long they'd been that in that condition. But the devil got Eve to take that fruit and he got Adam to take that fruit and as they ate that fruit that day as you know sin got into the human race and it got into their bloodstream polluted their blood and Adam and Eve became 
sinners. Now something happened in that day that was broke, see? That fellowship was broke. Sin breaks your fellowship with God. Sin breaks the fellowship that God had with man. And it, and it made a gulf. And it, and it spread them apart. And it opened it up. And next time God come walking down there in the garden, He said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God and were ashamed to go out and face God because of their sin. Let me say, that's what sin will do. Sin will make you ashamed. Sin will make you ashamed to come to church. Sin will make you ashamed to face the light. Sin will make you run when the preacher knocks on your door. Sin will make you ashamed to face God with your life. And so we see that was Job's day. Job could not escape the rod of God. He could not escape it. It was on him. The wrath of God was hanging over Job and he knew it very well. And so Job said, I can't talk to him. I can't get to him. The fellowship between me and God Almighty is broken. That's what happened when sin came into this world. Now everybody get settled down now. Everybody get settled down. Keep these kids still. Want everybody settled, okay? And brother, you know what Job did? Job said, I cannot fellowship with God anymore. That was during Job's day. Job knew that the Bible would say one day that would be sure that your sin would find you out. Job knew that there was no way he could talk to God because his sins loomed over him. Adam and Eve started it. They couldn't face God because of their sin. And Job realized that was true. Sure did. Now, we're going to talk about secondly this morning, that was Job's day. That was Old Testament. That's the way it was in the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy all the way through the Old Testament typified by the great types in the Bible that Brother John mentioned this morning in Sunday school. Now, secondly this morning, I want to talk about the greatest day. Now, Job said, there's nobody that come, can come between me and God. There's nobody that can talk to Him and talk to me and so we can settle this matter and get things back on speaking terms with God. Job said, God won't come down here and talk to me because He's holy. I can't go talk to God because I'm sinful. What in the world am I going to do? I want to tell you this morning about the greatest day. I want to tell you about the greatest day that's ever been in the history of this world. There's been some great days, people. There's been some great ones. I like to have been around that day when God began to create, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to have seen that on a on 3D screen and the Lord just out there in eternity and there wasn't nothing and all of a sudden the Lord said let there be light Boom! The lights came on in the universe before He ever made the sun and the moon and the stars. Wouldn't you like to have seen that? Yes, sir, that was a great day. It was a great day that God took His fingers and flung the planets out and the stars and all of the millions of planets out in outer space. It was a great day that God formed the earth and created and separated light from darkness. It was a great day when He put the waters and separated the waters and the heavens and God looked down and said, it's good. It was a great day when He made the animals and He made the plants grow and the fish in the sea. That was a great day. But then there's been other great days. That was a great day in the history of the world when God let that water fall out of the sky and flood the world. After Noah and his family were safe in the ark, the Lord shut the door back and brother, the water started falling. That was a great day. I'll guarantee you that. It was a great day in the book of Joshua when Joshua made the sun stand still and he just come out and he said, God, we need a little more time to whip these fellas. Let the sun stand still. God let the sun stand still and the moon in the same spot. And I know a lot of people find fault with the Bible over that. They say, well, I'll tell you what, that proves the Bible is unscientific because we all know that the sun don't move. And we all know that the earth spins and revolves around the sun. Well, we also know that uh, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I tell you what, brother, the Bible is always right. It is scientific. How come you don't find fault with the newspaper? 
Every morning you get the newspaper that says sunrise so and so time, sunset so and so time. You know what it's talking about. Don't, don't be so picky. Don't let demons get in you, brother. And we all know the sun. And, and by the way, you don't even know the sun don't move. The whole universe is moving, brother. It's all moving even though we are spinning. We are going around the sun. So don't ever believe them demons when they start talking to you about the Bible being unscientific. The Bible is the greatest science book in the world, the greatest history book in the world, and the greatest historical religious uh, book in the entire universe. And it's never wrong. And brother, that was a great day. It was a great day when God brought those children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage. I can see as they walked down out of that Red Sea, and boy, there they come down there, and Moses stuck out his rod over that sea, and the Lord go, and boy, when he does that, that water starts parting up like that. And Moses said, let's go, young'uns. And they all started marching down through their own dry ground. And can you imagine the wall of water on both sides of you? Wouldn't that have been wild? I mean, you can't look, look, mommy, there's a shark. Come on, son. Come on, boy. It's like, it's like Sea World down there. You could see fish swimming around, you know. They was walking through their own dry ground. That was a great day, folks. That was a great day. Sure enough, that was a great day. I like seeing that. It was a great day. You know, there's been great days in our history. They try to make you think they were great. Like October 21st, 1879, when Thomas finally invented the light bulb. His last name was Edison. Amen. And brother, he invented the light bulb. I think it was anyway. It was a great day, October 28th, 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That was a great Great day in our history. I want to tell you this morning, 1492 was a great day. 1879 might have been a great day. It might have been a great day when God delivered the Hebrew children out of a fiery furnace. It might have been a great day when God delivered Daniel from the lion's den. It might have been a great day. But I'm going to tell you about the greatest day that's ever been in the history of this old world. It's Matthew 27, 50. And it was the day that Jesus went to Calvary and by sin. That's the greatest day this world's ever seen. I'm telling you, that was the day. That was the day. That was the day when Jesus Christ walked up lonely, Golgotha, grabbed the hold of the Holy God with one hand. He grabbed the hold of a sinful man with the other hand. He hung between heaven and earth. They put nails in his hands and nails in his feet. They put the crown of thorns on his head. The blood rushed down. You know what he done? He grabbed a hold of old Danny Castle down here that couldn't talk to God. He grabbed a hold of God Almighty that wouldn't have nothing to do with Danny. And brother, he grabbed them and spread that mighty gulf. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God did spam at Calvary. That was the greatest day. Jesus broke, uh, uh, fixed the broken chain. It was like God was the engine and man was the cars. And the devil come along and broke it. And Jesus fixed it back like it ought to be. It was like a man and wife had an argument and the devil broke them. And Jesus come along and fixes it back like it's supposed to be. It was like two brothers that couldn't get along and wouldn't have nothing to do with each other. And Jesus laid one hand on one and the other hand on the other and bore their sin and put them back together. Boy, I tell you, I woke up this morning. I was thinking about last night. And I said, Lord, I'm, I can't preach on the cross. Every time, I, the Lord, I believe the Lord wants me to preach on the cross. And I start thinking about that holy blood, sinless blood, perfect blood. Wonderful blood dripping down on that, on them. And I think how sorry I am. I thank God I'm not even worthy to get up there and mention that blessed scene. It was so sacred. It was so holy. It was so righteous. 
that day that Jesus took my sin to Calvary. But uh, I thought, I, you know what? I woke up this morning. I said, God, I can't do it. I'm not even right enough to get up there and brag on that bird. I said, God, I'm not worthy to get up there and talk about something that wonderful. And the Lord seemed to speak to me this morning and said, Danny, that is exactly why I want you to do it is because you're not worthy. And there's be a bunch of other people there that's not worthy. That's why you need to talk about it. I'm telling you this morning, people, the devil will break our fellowship with God and the devil will tell you God ain't got nothing to do with you and the devil will tell you God's all tired of you and the devil will tell you there's no hope for you and the devil will tell you you're just too mean and too rotten and low down. I'm telling you this morning, there's a daysman, there's somebody between you and God that's pleading your case, that's covered your sins, and you can be right with God this morning. Thank God for that mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Well, the third day I want to talk about is our day. Because of Calvary, our day is different than Job's day. Number one, we can talk to God. You can talk to Him this morning. In First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, the Bible said there's one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. I witnessed to a lady yesterday. I had to do a, a, a guy's wedding down in Spartanburg, South Carolina. My second cousin. I went down there and done the wedding ceremony. I was coming back. I was talking to this lady. She, I said, uh, Jesus loves you. And she said, I appreciate that. He sure does and all that. And uh, she said, she began to talk about her faith. And she said, uh, do you believe in the blessed virgin? And I said, I believe she was a blessed virgin. And I began to talk to her and I said, but that's all she was. She's a sinner just like anybody else. Mary had to offer a sacrifice there in the book of Luke, a, a turtle dove and a pigeon. She was a poor sinner at that and had to have a Savior to save her from her sins. And I began to talk to this lady and somebody come in and interrupt and that's as far as I got. But I'm telling you this morning, the Bible said there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That means that there's one way for you to get to God this morning. You go through Jesus Christ. There's no, it won't do you any good to come up here and confess your sins to me. I don't want to hear them. i got enough of my own. I mean, it ain't going to help me. I can't handle yours, man. i tell you what. But I can tell you somebody can. I can tell you somebody can help you out. I can tell you somebody can get you on the on the direct 1-800 number. And it ain't never busy. And he's always in his office. And you can talk directly to him this morning through Jesus Christ. That's the difference. The Bible said he's able to save the uttermost. Them that come to God by him. Boy, if we could ever get that through our head. If it ever dawned on us that Jesus is pleading in our cause. Pleading in our stead. And that he is making intercession for us. It would make all the difference in the world in you and I as a child of God. But then that secondly, in our day, we can come together in judgment. Do you know the Bible said in Hebrews 4.16 that we can come boldly under the throne of grace? I read back there in that Old Testament where that priest could go into that holy place and that high priest could go into the Holy of Holies one time a year. And buddy, he had to be clean and right when he went in. He had to wash in that labor, wash his hand, get all the stained sin off of him. And brother, that old boy, he could walk in the Holy of Holies. That's where God was. Do you realize when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that the veil that separated that holy place from everything else ripped from the top to the bottom. You ever read about it? They say that thing was four inches thick, man. That thing, that thing was so high. They, have you ever tried a, a four-inch phone book and just rip it in two with your hands? You can't do it. Nobody did that. No, them disciples wasn't up there waiting with a big old knife. Tell me when he does. 
Is he dead yet? Oh, he is, huh? Start sowing. That wasn't the way it was. And Fanny went in there there and died before Jesus died on the cross. That was the Holy of Holies where God was. But the second, you know what happened? Can you imagine that day? Big old earthquake. <laughs> Ground started shaking. Everybody looking like this. It got pitch dark. He hung his head and said, It's finished. Boom. As soon as he did, that thing went... <laughs> just like that and ripped it like a little piece of paper. Like it was a napkin or something. That thing, you know what that was showing? That veil opened up. And God said, Alright, whosoever will, come right on in. You can come right in and have an office with the Holy of Holy. Buddy, here I am, old low-down Denny Castle. Ain't fit to live, ain't fit to die. I ought to be in hell this morning. Oh, yes, sir. Do you know what I've done before I come to church this morning? I got down in my bedroom, and when I got down, I just said, Dear Father, and as soon as I said that, I went right in to the Holy of Holies. There's somebody taking care of me. There's somebody taking care of my sins. They're all gone today. They're all gone. They're all gone. Thank God my sins are gone. You ask me why I'm happy, so I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. You say, well, Brother Danny, you ain't much. You said that right, but I got a daysman. I got somebody between me and God. I got somebody between me and the Lord that opened up the way that I could get in. Then there's, I can escape his punishment. Joe Job said, I can't handle it. God's going to whack me. He's going to come down on me with that rod just any time. Not me. Not you. We've got a daysman. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 9 said, That's more now being justified by his blood. We shall be saved. And the Bible said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I've used this illustration before, but I'll use this. I'll close this morning. You know why God don't judge me for my sins? It's not because I don't deserve it. I do deserve it. But it's because when Jesus died on the cross, He took all our sins and placed them on Him. So when I believe on Him and I trust Him as my Savior, what happens is, God, my sins are judged by Tarek Calvary. Now, it's like they said years ago, them Indians was out in the desert, way out, 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 out in the plains out west. And they used to have these prairie fires that were real bad and burned the, the whole countryside up. And many times those fires would get started in that old dry bus. It'd just go all the way across the country. It'd burn up, it'd burn up their teepees and their, their cattle and their sheep and everything. And finally they wised up. And they, what they'd do, they'd take them some firebrands and they'd go out there around the, the camp and they'd burn a big old strip, maybe, maybe a hundred feet strip and burn that big old strip all the way around the camp. So when you look, if you look down over over our plane, it looked like a great big black circle around that, that uh, camp there. And what it would do, that would protect them. So when a prairie fire got started, it would burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and burn. But when it got that place that was already burnt, it stopped. And the Indians would always say this. They'd say, why do you do that? And they'd say to protect, they say, the fire cannot go where the fire has already been. And that was their saying. And so, we, we think about the judgment of God. When we get to heaven, brother, God's not going to judge us for our sins. I mean, they're already judged. The fire cannot come where the fire has already been. I'm telling you, brother, when we stand before God, the Lord's going to say, safe. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now you know what your problem is? Believe in that. Your problem is accepting that. You need to accept what you've got in the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil cheats you. You know, we say we believe we're saved by grace, but then we act like and live like we're saved and kept by our works. I'm telling you this morning, brother, if the Bible's right, and I know it is, we are saved by the grace of Almighty God, and it's His grace, not my works, that's kept saved me and kept me saved, and I can rejoice in that this morning because of what He's done for me. Too many times we rejoice over what we've done for Him. We ought to rejoice over what He has done for us. The judgment cannot fall where the judgment has already been. I told you before, I mentioned it on the tape I put on the radio. One time I dreamed, I, I dreamed that I either shot or tried to shoot the president. I don't know why I dreamed that. And uh, they put me in jail. And it was awful feeling. I mean, it was awful. I'd seen Oswald, these film clips of Lee Harvey Oswald. You know, I seen Jeffrey Dahmer's on trial here the other day. You know, but boy, you don't, that's an awful feeling. They slam them bars and I was just dreaming. I ain't never been in jail. That's close enough for me. And boy, they slammed them door and I thought, man, I'm going to the electric chair. I won't be able to live a normal life. I thought, good night, I'm in a mess. And then somebody come, and a lawyer got to work and got me out. And I believe the Lord was speaking. When I woke up, it was just like God was saying, that's the way you was when you were 16, you were 17. In the first part of your 18th year, you were in bondage. You were a slave. And that old song said, I was guilty. With nothing to pay. And they were coming to take me away. Then a voice from heaven was heard. And the Lord said, take me and let him go. I should have been crucified. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. You're here this morning. We're not trying to make a Baptist out of you. We're not trying to get you to join this church. People, we've, our church is 15 years old. And I've never, ever, one time got up and pled with people to join. I've never even opened the doors of this church. Not one. I never got up and said the doors were open. Who, don't you feel the Spirit striving with you to come and join? Never. Everybody that's want to join just said, hey, I want to join. And that way, it ain't, uh, it's your fault when things go wrong. And I'm telling you what, brother. I'm not interested in making a church member out of you. I'm not interested in converting you over to that. What? That's accomplishing nothing. I'll tell you what I am trying to do this morning. I'm trying to point you to the Lamb of God that can take your sins away. And if you need to have peace with God this morning, I can tell you how to get it. You believe that Christ died for your sins on the cross, and you will never, ever, ever have any peace and joy, forgiveness in your heart, till you accept that and trust Him as your personal Savior. Have you ever done that? Has there ever come a time in your life when you got it settled with God? If you died right now, could you know your sins are paid for? Do you know you're saved? You say, well, I got baptized when I was a little... No. That ain't... As a payment for your sins. There's a daysman today. Christian, there's no use. There's no sense in you going around with a heavy load on your back. Poor fellow walking up the road here this morning on the way to church. Somebody probably saw him. He had big old packs and backs on. I felt so sorry for that guy. I thought, Lord, have mercy. He was walking up through there like this. I don't know. Looked like he had everything he owned must have on his back. My heart just went out to him. And I told Carrie, I said, my, isn't that pitiful? Look how awful that looks. And I saw myself. It used to be the way I used to have to go around. 
I had all my sins. Listen now. I had all my sins on my shoulder. But not anymore. Not anymore. They're gone. I'm glad I got it right. I messed up everything I ever done in my life, folks. There's one thing I know that I got right. I know I got saved. I know I got saved. Hallelujah! I know I got saved. Boy, it is settled! It's done! I'm not worried about all the things with being saved ain't one of them. I know what He done for me. I know what He done for me. And I know He can do it for you. This could be a good day for you. This could be a great day for somebody here. This could be the day when you come and make it in. This could be the day you get all your sins forgiven. This could be the day. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no talking, no one leaving the building. Is God dealing with your heart this morning, friend? Is God dealing with your heart? Is He? Maybe there's somebody here this morning, Christians are praying. Is there someone here this morning say, Brother Danny, I've never really heard it explained like that. But for the first time in my life, I understand why Jesus died on the cross. He died to save me from my sins. He died to save me from my sins. Let me tell you something, ma'am. God loves you this morning. Sir, God loves you this morning. You don't have to walk out of here under the wrath and rod and condemnation of God Almighty. You can leave here today with all of your sins forgiven. You sure can. You sure can. You leave here today with all of your sins forgiven. That's why, Lord, won't you come this morning to hear this message? Really, it is. Ain't no doubt in my mind. God's here. God's here. The Lord's here this morning, folks. A church can't have a better testimony than to just know that God's here. Numbers not important. Money's not important. Facilities are not important. But God being here is important. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's here this morning. Why don't you let Him forgive you? I want to ask you a question this morning. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, we're not going to tie along. We'll have a couple of verses of an invitational song and let you go. I wonder this morning if someone here would say, Brother Danny, I do need your prayers. I want this church to pray for me. I want this church to pray for me. Please pray for me. Would you just slip up your hand and let us pray for you this morning? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just slip up your hand. We're not going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to come to you. Anybody else? I see your hand, man. I see your hand over yonder. Anybody else? Anybody else? Slip up your hand and take it right back down. Anyone? Anyone else? I see you. Anyone else? Just slip it up. God bless you, ma'am. I see your hand. It's nothing to be ashamed of. This is nothing. This is serious. This is important. Anyone else before we pray? Anyone else? Just slip up your hand and say, please remember me in this prayer. I'm not ready to meet the Lord. Please remember me in this prayer. Anyone else? Dear God, I pray that you would bless these that lifted their hands. Lord, I don't know what their need is. God, I know that you're great and mighty and powerful. And I know that you do. Glory to God, I pray that you'd meet them. I pray that the Holy Ghost of God will tug at that heart. Lord, that you'd rule around them this morning. Lord, that you'd let them realize how much you care. Lord, that you'd let them realize how much you love them. Lord Jesus, that you'd draw them to Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that they'd take their step out of that pew this morning. They'd walk down here and get down on their knees and realize that the daysman is here. 
the days when has come. No longer do we have to offer up sacrifices of bulls and goats and cows and oxen. But thank God the days when has made the way, has opened up the way, has rid the veil, made the way, opened the door. We can come into the presence of the Holy God. Our Father, we pray that you'd open the eyes of some person here this morning. Let Jesus be real to their soul. Let them leave here this morning knowing they're forgiven. We will praise you and thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand all over the house. God spoke to your heart this morning. You need to make a trip down here to this altar. This Jesus Christ wasn't ashamed of you. When he went up there and let him put nails in his hand, right out in public, he was not ashamed of you. He was not ashamed of you. And I'm asking you today not to be ashamed of him. Not to be ashamed to walk down him and, and get down on your knees and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You come right now while we sing that first verse. Come on right now. Come on right now. Everybody sing. Come on right now. You need to come. Just get out of your seat and come. There'll be somebody down here to play with you. Too. Come on. Come on. Just get out of your seat and come. This can be the morning. You make things right with God. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Let the Lord help you this morning, my friend. Maybe you're a Christian here this morning. You're carrying a heavy load. You need to get down here this morning and get things right. You might play that little boy right there. Maybe God is dealing with your heart. Let the Lord help you this morning, my friend. Let the Lord help you this morning. Come on. Just get out of your seat and come. Come on. Just get out of your seat and come. Right now. Sing it, Brother John. Don't tell him this thing. Everybody. Everybody ready? Sing it. Amen. Let God speak your heart. Let God speak your heart. Let God speak to your heart. Let the Lord help you right now. Come on. Come on. Amen. Raise your soul with one body block. That's right. That's right. Amen. ask you a question this week. This morning we're going to sing one more verse. You that lifted your hands, you want to do something about it? See, the Word of God preached will get you the conviction. And then it's up to you to do something about it. It's up to you to say yes or no. It's up to you to say, yep, there's a bomb in Gilead. Now I believe that God wanting to fix me up this morning. It's up to you, friend. You respond. You accept. The invitation's given. The invitation's given. One day, have you done this morning what you will look back at Judgment Day and say, I'm glad I did? Will you look back one of these days at Judgment Day and say, I've done the right thing in that service at New Mount Baptist Church? In March of 1992. Oh, you look back and say, Boy, I wish I'd have done that. I wish I'd have got right. I wish I'd have made that step. We're going to hang, uh, have one more verse. Sing, God speaking to your heart. You settle that issue between you and Him right now. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on, right now, come on. Let's get out of your seat. The Lord will receive. Amen. Yes.
these are still finishing up praying now. We're going to uh, let you go. So don't forget, Youth Choir at 530. That means 